All right, so we're back here. I'm wondering what it was that you guys came up with. I, I edited this graph a little bit. I switched up the scale. If you look on here, sure, I went from negative 360 on the x-axis to positive 360, but I made the step size 30, as in 30 degrees, and that's going to make it a little bit easier for us to figure out what the correct interval is supposed to be. So I'm going to swipe this picture and bring this right over here. Let's get rid of this garbage. Okay, that's good. And then insert. Okay. Yep. So a lot of us want to pick something along the lines of, well, when we're dealing with right triangle trigonometry, it seems like I would pick something like this. If I pick something like this, this is zero degrees. Remember that these increments go by 30. There's 150. So this is... Uh, 30 degrees more than that, that'd be 180, from 0 to 180. The problem with that hill shape is that it would not pass the horizontal line test, right? I can clearly see that. So that is the incorrect interval. So the interval that we do pick is from this trough point, that's what it's called, to this, or trough or valley, um, to this hill point, to the top of the hill. It's this portion of the graph that we keep. Okay, red on red, that's not gonna work very well. So let's choose green, jupe and jupe, and it's this portion of the graph that we're going to keep, Womp, like so. All right, what um, x value is that? So from right here to right here, let's just count these things up. I'll zoom in just a little bit. You can see this is 30, 60, this is negative 90 degrees. And this is, again, 30, 60, 90, positive 90 degrees. You can see that there's some symmetry to this graph. This graph has a couple of kinds of symmetry. Uh, the first kind of symmetry that it has is that this thing could be rotated 180 degrees around the origin. It'd look the same, so it has rotational symmetry. We call that kind of function an odd function. And then it also has translational symmetry. So translational symmetry looks like this. If I just go like this on the graph, it just looks the same. It's an example of a periodic function. It happens, the same thing happens just like over and over and over and over and over again. Okay, so what this means for us is this. Come back over here. When we're doing the inverse of sine, in order to get an angle measurement instead of a side, the inverse of sine will only ever give us an angle measurement between negative 90 and positive 90. That means it will never, whenever I put this thing into the calculator, it will never give me an obtuse angle some angle that lives over here. It's impossible. In the same way that whenever we worked this problem backwards here and took the square root of 25, even though negative 5 is also a square root of 25, your calculator absolutely won't give it to us. And again, the reason why is because we've gotten rid of that part of the graph in order for the inverse to be a function. The same thing happened here. We got rid of the obtuses for sine so that the inverse of sine can be a function. Let's do the same thing with cosine. So let me pull this graph back up. All right, so this still looks okay. Just right underneath here, I'm going to graph y is equal to cosine. Pull the functions up and then the cosine, just so that we can easily compare them. And you can see that these graphs look identical. It's just that the blue graph, which is cosine, is just shifted to the left you can see from, if I can put a little point there, um, and here's the corresponding point right over here on the blue graph. It's just been shifted to the left by a certain amount, and it's exactly 90 degrees as a shift here, or if you prefer, pi over 2 radians. So I'm going to hide that one so we can just take this one, and uh, I'll swipe this graph. I think I can just do, what is it like? No, no, it's, there it is. Okay done and save to photos okay whatever now let's pull that one in here is that an extra little page for cosine mm -hmm. and we'll see does the same exact interval work for cosine so the interval interval for sine was from negative 90 degrees and if I count this as one, one, two, three of those little markings here. So from negative 90 to positive 90 would go right there. Well, we have the same problem that we initially had on the sine graph. So it's sort of a parabola, parabolic kind of shape. It's definitely not a parabola, but still 
It has that kind of shape to it, which looks like a hill, and that would not pass a horizontal line test. So it doesn't get the same interval that sine did for the inverse of sine. What interval are we going to select? So for this one, when we pick is from zero degrees here to this lower point, this trough point down here. And uh, when you're counting, that's 150, 30 more from that is 180 degrees. Yeah, it's this part of the graph. That goes from, once again, zero degrees to 180 degrees. This is the interval over which the inverse of cosine is valid. And this is super convenient because it has all the angle measurements that we would associate with a, a triangle. Very, very useful. So this one will give us acute angles back. It'll also give us obtuse angles back, whereas, unfortunately, the inverse of sine only gives us the positive and the negative acute angles. It also gives us right angles. And I know what you're thinking. What are you talking about? Right triangles? I never use it of uh, the right angle in order to get a side measurement or something like that. And you're right. And the reason why is that, hey, the actual definition of sine and cosine doesn't have anything to do with right triangles. It's just the application that we're using. Because you can see that it's defined for all real numbers here, not just the numbers that are inside of the acute angle or whatever. Let's do one more. And that's for tangent. And then we'll just kind of wrap that up. So tangent graph, super weird. So let me uh, delete that graph or hide that one, and let's do y is equal to the tangent of x inside here for the angle, and what the heck? So this shape here, oh, what the heck's going on? Um, I don't need these extra ones there. Okay, whatever. So the shape, all of these green things here, whenever I highlight one, they're all disconnected. There is this imaginary line that is in between each one of these little sections. Again, I'm just going to screenshot this and bring this over here. So there's this imaginary line that the graph gets closer and closer to and never, ever touches. You may remember what the heck that's called from Algebra 1. And you usually talk about it in terms of exponential functions. So I'm going to draw one in here, but I just have to find one. So again, these things go by increments of 30. So this is 30, 60, 90. It's got to be this point that's right here in the middle. 30, 60, 90, and then 30, 60, 90 right there. So if I draw myself a vertical line straight through here, stop moving stuff around. Let this thing straighten out. There we go. And then one over here at positive 90 degrees. Okay, so your graph is not going to put those things in here because they're not really part of the graph of tangents. But this thing is called an asymptote. Let me write that down. And an asymptote is a line that's not really part of your graph but it's a line that your graph actually tries to get closer and closer and closer and closer to and never actually reaches it. Okay, so um, this is at negative 90 degrees and then positive 90 degrees. Since it never ever hits 90 degrees, that means the tangent of 90 degrees is not defined. Try to put it in your calculator. I'm just gonna go to the scientific calculator here. It's set to degrees, that's awesome. And uh, on here, the functions, oh, there's a tangent. And I try to put in 90, and it just goes, oh, that sucker's undefined. And let's say that I back that up, and I try to put in negative 90, negative 90, and it goes, oh, yeah, that's undefined as well. So uh, the, the entire reason doesn't have anything to do with right triangles. It has to do with the original circular definition of sine, cosine, and tangent. And you, what actually happens here is that tangent, just a quick aside here, y is equal to the tangent of x is the same thing as the sine of x over the cosine of x. And wherever the heck the cosine is equal to zero, that's where tangent is undefined because you're going to be dividing by zero. So that's the reason why we have these kind of these asymptotes here, and it chops up our graph into little pieces. So it kind of gives us a clue as to what section of this to use for the inverse. And it's just between the first two asymptotes that are around the origin, which is from negative 90 to positive 90. It's going to look really similar to the inverse of 
sine. The only difference is sine got the negative 90 and positive 90, but tangent is not going to for the inverse. So here, let's summarize those two things, those three things, right about, here we go. Okay, so let me explain what's going on in this image. So this is the way that we ordinarily set up the sine ratio. Oops. The sine of x, and this x here, remember, is supposed to be an angle. Angle is equal to a over b. This is the ratio of our sides, and we know that that is supposed to be the opposite side for the hypotenuse, at least as it applies to right triangle trigonometry. Okay? So now the inverse is going to reverse those things. So the inverse of sine looks like this. The thing that looks like an exponent is not actually an exponent. This is the notation for the inverse. And that's the way we read it. We read it as the inverse of sine. Some people call this arcsine. And the reason why they do is because this can, this can be confused with a negative 1 exponent, which it's not. Negative 1 exponent means reciprocal, and that is an unfortunate coincidence with the notation. Uh, so some people prefer this notation instead. So notice what happens here is that we're putting in the ratio into the inverse sine, and it's going to spit out the angle measurement. But the inverse of sine is only going to spit out an angle measurement from negative 90 degrees to positive 90 degrees. Over here on the right-hand side, this says that our ratio can only ever be from negative 1 to positive 1. It'll never be bigger than 1. It'll never be smaller than negative 1. If we look at the graph for sine, that also will play out. Here's cosine. Here's the sine. So you can see that down here it hits at negative 1, and it hits at positive 1, and it never goes beyond those numbers. It's kind of it's locked into that range for the original sine function. Okay, coming back over here. Okay, now for the cosine. Again, on this original thing, x is the angle measurement. It's going to spit out a ratio a over b, a being the adjacent side, b being the hypotenuse for right triangles. And then when we reverse this, the inverse of cosine, I'll put in the ratio, it's going to spit out the angle. That angle for inverse of cosine is from 0 to 180 degrees, a different interval than the sine. Sine can never give you an obtuse angle working backwards, but cosine certainly can. Notice that the ratio here is also bound between negative 1 and positive 1, and we can see that also on the graph for cosine. It goes from, you can see right up here up top, this is the number 1, and down here is negative 1, and it's locked in just like sine was locked in. All right, and then finally, tangent. Tangent of x, x is an angle, this is supposed to be an opposite over adjacent for right triangles. Reversing this, I put in the inverse of tangent of the ratio, it spits out the angle measurement, and sort of like sine, it only gives me an angle from negative 90 to positive 90. Notice a big difference here, that sine says equal signs, but then the tangent doesn't, because there's those vertical asymptotes in between here. It's undefined at negative 90 and at positive 90, but anything between those two things will work. Uh, over here, it says that the ratio is, this symbol, you might remember from like semester one stuff, means is an element of, and this is the weird, I don't know what the heck that symbol is. It's supposed to look like this. I know you recognize this one, which is a symbol for all real numbers. It just means that your uh, output for tangent is supposed to be a real number, any real number, not bound between negative 1 and positive 1, but from negative infinity to positive infinity. You see that on the graph. Down here is pointing towards negative infinity, and up here is pointing towards positive infinity. Okay, in the next video, we'll see like how all of this is applied in order to solve a trig ratio backwards in order to find an angle measurement.